Hello, Plastic Pills listeners. This is Victor. I'm joined by my fellow left lib compatriot, Matt McManus, bringing you a treat of an interview today. Benjamin Teitelbaum is Assistant Professor of Ethnomusicology and International Affairs at the University of Colorado Boulder. He is a scholar and ethnographer of contemporary radical nationalism in Europe and globally. Teitelbaum's first book, titled Lions of the North, Music and the New Nordic Radical Nationalism, examined the role that traditional Scandinavian folk music, as well as some other genres, played in new radical nationalist movements. To accomplish this research, Teitelbaum mastered the Swedish language and embedded himself with several ethno-nationalist groups. One reviewer called the book an open-minded quest to understand his interlocutors. Rather than undermining their cause, he takes their fears, grievances, and concerns seriously without trivializing or denying the harmful effects of their racist and xenophobic resentments. Such an approach is, I believe, urgently important for left-wing intellectuals in our contemporary polarized moment. Teitelbaum's second book, which is the focus of this podcast, is War for Eternity Inside Bannon's Far-Right Circle of Global Power Brokers. Though interestingly, I think the European market has a different subtitle, which I actually think maybe is better, uh, The Return of Traditionalism and the Rise of the Populist Right. So in the book, Teitelbaum engages with the still not very well-known capital T traditionalist philosophy connected to several uh, recent global far-right figures, including Alexander Dugan, Jair Bolsonaro, and Steve Bannon, the latter, which Teitelbaum managed to score over 20 hours of interviews with. Glenn Greenwald called it an indispensable text for understanding the most profound and tumultuous political shifts defining uh, societies on every continent. I agree. Uh, the book manages to shift effortlessly between nuanced ethnographic and theoretical reflection and exciting journalistic nonfiction narrative. Honestly, listeners, if you have any interest in our political moment and some of the underlying political theory, pick this book up. It was a joy to read or listen to in my case. I'll also say reading about traditionalist concerns and grievances. I've never felt more like a globalist. I feel maybe I want to reclaim that term. Also, as we're recording now, just a couple days uh, ago, Trump supporters stormed the Capitol, so it feels somewhat appropriate to be having this interview. Anyway, I'm very excited for this conversation. Benjamin Teitelbaum, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be with you both. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming on. Uh, I really enjoyed your book, so I just wanted to start with that. But uh, before I get into the kind of substance of what you were uh, saying in this new text, I was just wondering, so what prompted you to look at politics initially uh, as an ethnomusicologist? I was in Sweden to do my dissertation research uh, as a graduate student. I was going to write a dissertation on asymmetrical rhythm in Swedish folk music. Hmm. And I promise you it would have been a good dissertation. No one would have <laughs> cared or read it, but it would have been very a very accurate study. <laughs> anyway, so I'm over there to do something very, very narrow and, and music theoretical, actually, more than ethnomusicological, which is the study of music and culture. And while I'm there, the Sweden Democrats enter parliament. Um, this is 2010, fall of 2010. And in the lead up to that, they announced their announcing initiatives. Of course, they're known by most people as, as an anti-immigrant nationalist xenophobic force in Swedish politics, the type that the country had prided itself on keeping out of its parliament for, uh, you know, since, since the, the war era, essentially, distinguishing Sweden in the European context. That's how most people thought about them, but they, they came out ahead of that election and said, you know what, one of our first initiatives will be to try and funnel funding to Swedish folk music. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay, well, that's kind of, you know, suddenly there's some political relevance, I, I hate the term, but to, to what I'm studying. And so I decided to probe it through a couple of interviews, and I could go deeper into why that appealed to me. I actually, at the time I was doing research, I was, I was somewhat resentful of what I thought was a praising of the ethnographic subject that I had been taught in graduate school that, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to study the world and we are going to love the people who we study. Mm -hmm. And I, I never liked that. And I always thought, well, this, this, isn't this just so contingent on you studying the right people? So how about I go mm -hmm. study people I don't like? <laughs> and that, <laughs> that story takes a number of twists and turns, of course, but um, so I went and did those interviews and the more I learned, you know, I saw that, that, that momentary, really a facade interest in folk music from some sectors of some parties in, in Swedish, uh, radical right-wing activism was telling a much larger story. It was about the reform of the radical right. It was about in increasing confidence on part of this political cause that actually there were political dividends to be reaped. 
uh, were they to reform themselves, that they actually were not complete pariahs uh, facing hopeless chances in electoral politics. And if they did the right things, they could actually lay claim to the future. All of that was baked into this one moment. And and the deeper I looked, it, it seemed that the interest in folk music was part of a broader push involving a number of different expressive forms to get away from a skinhead stereotype and a skinhead profile uh, as part of this push to reform. So that, that got me started. The ethnographic experience I found stimulating and challenging in a good way. And, and since then, I've, I've continued to study it any time Anytime that music is part of the subject, I think that's great. If it's not part of the subject, I don't, I don't say that it's off limits to me and I keep studying it. Cool. Yeah, I, I thought that a lot when I was reading your new book, uh, in part because I did my own fair share of social science research back in the day, and almost all of it was about marginalized communities that you tend to have a fair bit of sympathy for, you know, low-income families, people with legal problems, and, you know, you usually feel pretty bad for what's going on, and you empathize with what's happening. Uh, reading this new book and listening to some of the people, uh, naturally, as a left-wing guy, I kind of thought to myself, like, I would struggle to hold myself back uh, and to try to just let the material speak for itself in the way you did. So I applaud that. Uh, I guess like the first substantive question I had, and then we'll move on to Victor's, is uh, I'm interested personally in how it is that you conceive of this philosophy or ideology of traditionalism. Uh, so we've seen that word thrown around a lot uh, in a variety of different contexts. Uh, in your book, as Victor said, it's kind of capital T traditionalism. Uh, and you define it in a number of different ways throughout the text, and you know that's very uh, consistent with the fact that many of the adherents of so-called traditionalism adopt a different perspective uh, on it. Uh, and so one of the things I wanted to ask you is, is there kind of a unifying feature to capital T traditionalism? What does it stand for? Uh, or is it so highly localized uh, as a kind of reaction against modernity that there's nothing that really unites it except a kind of visceral distaste for, you know, cars and topless women or whatever it happens to be, right? <laughs> this, is, this is a wonderful and informed question. And one, one sign of that is that I actually can't give you, I'm not going to be able to give you a straight answer. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, there are no pro-modernity traditionalists that I have ever met. <laughs> so we can say that a, an initial qualification is, is the belief that modernity is, is a particular pest brought to humanity. And, and how one deals with that is, is another question. But if, if we look at the basics, uh, it, in its most theorized, and, and especially I would say in its original texts, um, traditionalists would not agree, of course, that there, there is an original text, but let's leave that aside. Uh, let's say in René Guénon, who is this, this French philosopher, uh, the belief is, French traditionalist philosopher, really the patriarch of the movement, the belief is, is that once upon a time, there was a true religion in the world, the Ur tradition, capital T. And we happen to live in a universe where as time goes on, things get worse opposite the values of progress and, and modernity and mo modernity and modernism that we're, that we're otherwise used to thinking through. Uh, and following that, that Ur tradition has been degraded as time has gone on. It's become lost to us. It's been fragmented, splintered in all these various traditions. And the best that we could hope for is to find some bastardized fragmentary piece of it and devote ourselves to it completely. And maybe we can use it as a channel, as a keyhole to peer through into what once was. Yeah. Um, if we start at that very simple level, uh, as I say, it sets us up to not be especially invested in campaigns for emancipation, mm -hmm. to not believe in progress, to not believe that we could create a world that is fundamentally better than one that has ever existed in the past. That's very general, it's very vague, but it's enough to make us anti-liberal. <laughs> right, assuming assuming that we want to have uh, that we believe that that politics plays a role in these in these deeper questions. If it's not just about you know I don't know, perhaps you think that that single payer single payer health care and universal health coverage is a good thing, as I do. Uh, perhaps someone treats that as a surface level concern, but in the big picture of things, big scheme, we uh, we're not going to be a traditionalist and be a progressive and a liberal. Right. Beyond that, you start to see a lot of, of fragmentation. That's uh, for sure. <laughs> and what I focus on in this book is, is really rightist traditionalism or political traditionalism as a, as a 
uh, one thinker, Charles Upton, asked me to call it, who's a traditionalist who's very much against the figures that I that I study in the book. But uh, to say that it uh, traditionalism belonging in the lineage of this proto-fascist philosopher Julius Evola is right as traditionalism. That, that's kind of a helpful doctrine to me. And in that case, mm-hmm. we're not just talking about an opposition to modernity and a belief that the past was better and a sort of worship of precedence. But we're talking about uh, fairly specific invocations of the Hindu caste hierarchy, belief in a time cycle, which I think is so, so important to a lot of the political movements that we see associated with traditionalism around the world today, a belief that we are in a, a process of decline and that we have to go into destruction in order to get back to a rebuilding of, of glory that once was. Um, those, that's where you see the fragmentation. But even, even there, even among those individuals who follow Julius Evola, there, there's a lot of variation in terms of, of people who take those, those directives and those characterizations as literal, almost spiritual truths, and others who, uh, such as Alexander Dugan said to me, uh, he said that, well, I take them as signposts. Uh, you know, they're just kind of guidelines and I do, I do what I want with it. So, so yes, we have to characterize tr- traditionalism as, as encompassing all of that. Uh, it certainly aids and makes, makes variation easier when you don't have an actual traditionalist creed, when you don't have traditionalist organizations or that many outlets. There's not that sort of organizational uh, infrastructure, but I would certainly encourage any, any listeners to to ponder also the fact that a lot of ideologies work in this way. Yeah. Um, look at look at the recent history, even just the the twentieth century history of Marxism, um, and how fragmented and you know how sectarian uh, that belief system has been in Latin America. Or you know, mm-hmm. it's this is more the standard for for intellectual history and political mapping and and organizational. Uh, mapping than than not. Cool. Yeah, I was going to say. I think uh, Victor and I, as um, political legal theorists, right, we sometimes like to say, well, there has to be kind of inner coherence to these movements, right? Uh, otherwise, they're not real ideologies, or they're not real Marxism, or not real traditionalism. And that's not really the way these things are when you actually set them in the wild uh, and people start to make of them what they will. Because um, what, what's really fascinating to me in the book is just how varied some of these opinions are from a kind of geopolitical standpoint. I mean, you have people who are very pro-China, people who are very pro-USA, like uh, Steve Bannon. Uh, you have people who have quasi-racial uh, ideas of how it is that nature works uh, versus Christian universalists, right? People who really believe in this kind of religious outlook that unites all humankind. Uh, the one sense that I did get for that kind of unites everybody is this idea that actually these are very mundane concerns uh, in a certain respect next to this spiritual narrative of decline that seems to unite all of them. That seemed to be the one constant, at least to me. Uh, but. I'll, I'll let it, Victor take over there. That was just well. If you want to say something about that, um, no, no, I agree with okay. that completely. That's okay, awesome. Yeah. yeah, and actually, one one observation I made uh, when I was well listening to your book was um, that the, there, and this is a pattern I, I often see. There's like you know political thinkers who are trying to get the public on board, and to some extent, I suppose Bannon is somebody who's trying to like you know um, like rally a movement or was trying to rally a movement. But you know, there's it, it almost seemed to me like there was like an exoteric. And then an esoteric, like, so, you know, to get the public on board, like sort of the elevator pitch that that would be often related to grievance politics. So things talking about, like, look at what's happening to these things. But it's like the actual members of the public, you know, they don't like know that much. Like they don't know traditionalist philosophy. They don't understand these things. So I wonder, like. It, it, I, you know, one thought I had when I was reading it, it almost reminded me of, of Scientology. It's like it, they, they pull you in with these like self-help things, but then they don't, you don't know about like the mystical underpinnings of it. And it's like that doesn't even seem that important for convincing the public. It's like you just need the grievance. And uh, I wonder how you see that. that absolutely. It's, it's one we can start at the beginning and, and look and say that, OK, so traditionalism, this political traditionalism that I've studied in the book, it overlaps with right wing populism and with just plain conservatism quite a bit. I get to that at the end of the book. One thing I regret is that I should have kind of put that observation right up front. Hmm. But it, it overlaps so much that you, you really 
and it's almost, it's, it's really too early to tell. You can't always tell, well, are these people genuine? Because there is always the possibility that traditionalism is the fancy language for people who are populists, but don't like the idea of themselves being populist. Mm. And as, as I see it, if we take the ideologies seriously and we, and we take their prescriptions seriously, we should see, we would see people showing their colors, let's say in the United States, showing whether they're a libertarian Tea Party or activist or a nationalist, um, a statist kind of nationalist, after they have done their desired destruction uh, rested it upon the U.S. government. <laughs> uh, do is there an absence of government after that, or is there the creation of a new state that they think is better, um, showing that they're they're really not against government per se, just the one that we have at this moment? Uh, th there there are those tipping points, flashpoints to be found uh, throughout the scheme, and especially if you think about a political ideology reaching maturation to the extent such a thing makes sense. Um, and 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 again, we can't we can't answer that that question right now. One thing, though, that we we can at least ponder, and I and I think it's I think it's a helpful intellectual exercise to do this, if nothing else, is what is the role of of racism? You mentioned grievances, uh, Victor. Is it possible? Would we ever want to say that racism is the exoteric, is the hmm. selling point of something deeper? Uh, so often. When you, when you look at politics, especially mainstream politics in the West, I'm used to encountering from my colleagues the claim that, okay, well, this, you know, people are talking about moving to a nice neighborhood and, oh, and, you know, stay away from the hooligans and the thugs and we don't want the welfare queens, um, that you have all this language uh, dressing up racial resentment. Mm. And, and in Bannon's case, who has been a race baiter and, and Breitbart has, has been this, uh, you know, bent over backwards to accommodate the causes of identitarians and white nationalists uh, throughout, throughout his, his leadership of it and, and, and since, you, you at least confront the idea, well, what if the racism is actually concealing something else? I'm not sure that's true, of course, <laughs> but it's a helpful intellectual exercise for, for those of us who are trying, trying to get a deeper understanding of what, what is going on right now. And certainly... That would really surprise a lot of people, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> if you thought in those terms. And it doesn't mean that that's, that's true. Maybe I, I'm, I lean more in the direction of thinking that traditionalism gives us, you know, gives these people cover and justification for, for something that might be more, more plain. But... I don't know. I don't know. It mm. requires a degree of, of, of mind reading that, that I'm not comfortable with as a scholar. I might be as a journalist, but not as a scholar. Yeah, for sure. And actually, um, you know, it, that, that makes me think about uh, another, another thought I had, which was, I was wondering what kind of, in both the process of writing uh, War for Eternity, as well as your previous work, um, spending time with all these people, um, you know, obviously there's a variety of different kinds of nationalism uh, between the two books, I'm sure. But like, did you make any sort of psychological observations of, of people? Because one one thing I've I've noticed when I encounter people who are really like um, politically engaged and politically mobilized, like very partisan, and, and there's like a lot of emotions behind it usually. And um, I've often, you know, I, I once took a class uh, when I was doing my master's. It was like a super woke class. Uh, awesome. It was about like prisoner prisoner justice reform, like really interesting moral questions about like, you know, what's the justification for keeping, um, you know, keeping prison, the prison industrial complex. But I just noticed that a lot of my classmates, you know, who were very involved in that world, they were less interested in the intellectual exercise and more interested in, in being angry at the system, you know, and like, and it f almost felt more like a group therapy session than it did like, you know, a, 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 a class. And I would imagine you might observe something similar uh, with really politically. Uh, and, and I guess the, the insight that I often had was, you know, is this a, like, is your anger a symptom of something else inside you know like something personal you know i th I, th I don't find anger that interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> might be yeah i guess sh i guess shame i guess anger is almost like an offshoot of shame sometimes where but am I, I i can tell you where my thoughts are going at least victor i'm, I'm thinking about certainly people who the term is disenfranchised but i yeah. I, I would rather mm -hmm. it be more social and and psychological than that but people who feel powerless um, violated, like they've had something taken from them and that it was unjust. 
that can I've seen that of course produce anger. That's that's the most intelligible response to that. But equal of equal note, and for most of my scholarly career, this has been the dominating predominant response from traditionalist people in that in that sector of the radical right. It's it's also produced despondency. Mm. Um, you know that that narrative that okay we've lost the future. The future isn't ours. I've lost the public sphere. I've lost the public debate. We've lost the mainstream. Um, my identity, the way I'm going to live out my radical rightness is by commemorating and mourning defeat. If I could just right. interject there as, and you know, carry on. Uh, one of the examples of that that came up through really prominently is um, there was a kind of puritanical quality to some of the traditionalists that you interviewed. But what really fascinated me is this could be juxtaposed in other instances by this almost hedonistic embrace of things like drugs and alcohol mm -hmm. culture, uh, sex, you know, um, mm -hmm. <sighs> which seemed to really reflect what you were talking about, not to mention uh, more kind of postmodern iterations of despondency you're talking about, you know, irony, trolling, just trying to get a mm. rise out of people. Would you say that's kind of reflective of that? Uh, yes, yes. Of a say la vie... <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, sort of, sort of dismissal. Yes. I, I, one of the concepts I really wanted to write about, I did write about in a draft and it got cut was, was, you know, what I call right-wing melancholia, mm -hmm. oh, that'd which be interesting. is, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. which is this, I, I think, I think it saturates a lot of different areas of their activism. This it, it's, it's a, it's a Heideggerian sense of being in the world that this mm -hmm. is the way that the way that I relate to things is by divesting myself of, an, of, of any hope for their future, mm -hmm. disavowing any obligation to participate in the creation of a better society because it's lost. Mm -hmm. um, we, might, we might speak about that more colloquially as, as a martyr complex, of course, uh, right. predominant, predominant. But I, th I, think it, I think it's deeper than that because of the, because of the way that it's, it's celebrated. Um, you know, the, the, the use of hallucinogenics in, in the radical right, and I think in this, in this sector of the mm -hmm. radical right has a number of roots. It also also speaks to their belief that, you know, a materialistic worldview or the world that we see is not the real world mm -hmm. and that you can access a deeper spiritual world that's beyond the reaches of managerial liberalism uh, through through experimentation uh, and and through through altering your consciousness in various ways through spirituality or through drugs. Right. Um, yeah, I can go on about this a long time. So. <laughs> this is, I have a big article coming out about this soon. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, I'd um, so really like to read it because I, I thought that was really interesting, right? Just because you see these kinds of, uh, you see the sense of reprobation that sometimes takes place amongst these people, right? Where uh, they're lamenting the fact that they've been corrupted by this modern world, like you're talking about how it is that they're almost desperately trying to get back to something that they feel has been taken away from them. Uh, but then in other instances, their response to it seems to be to not embrace modern hedonism, but to almost use as an outlet for all these energies and all this animosity that they're not able to channel in any other effective direction, right? And you know, Matthew, I, I, I even see that I, I see that less as a theorized response mm -hmm. from from some of these figures, and and more just as a as yeah. a palpable fact of their existence. If you watch them, mm. um, you know, Steve Bannon, in the word piety, could barely. I they just they he's you know swears more than anyone I've ever met. <laughs> more colorful. Uh, you know, vocabulary of profanities than just about anyone I've, I've ever met in my life. Um, the, some conservative actors in Scandinavia that I know very well lead very hedonistic lives, more so than I've ever seen. Oh, that's interesting. So, and it's, it's not theorized, but, but yes, this, this uh, dismissal of decorum, some, some might even say, uh, you know, rejection of society, um, mm -hmm. refusal to to invest in social norms uh, with the belief that doing so is going to make your life better mm -hmm. in some way. That key conservative impulse is, is missing for the person who's much more fatalistic and is, and, and does not care uh, about maintaining what's good about society now, because with society right now, there is nothing good to it. Mm -hmm. That gets distilled in traditionalism in a way that it's, it's really just an element or latent in other, other ultra conservative ideas and conservative ideas, by the way. Yeah, for sure. So I was, uh, you know, I think I was thinking before about like, um, sort of related to the exoteric, esoteric distinction. Um, you know, that I, th I think 
people who get attracted to these ideas, I wonder, and maybe you spent less time talking to the, like, you know, people who are like, you know, who I'm, I don't know if you've explored much the YouTube under underworld of, of traditionalism and all these YouTubers. And I feel like the followers often I've talked to some of them, uh, there's there there tends to be the type of people who don't feel very comfortable in their own skin, I suppose. And this like, you know, this they, they get pulled in by something that is an answer for them about like why they're feeling that way. And I guess maybe that's what I was thinking about before more than and anger is not exactly the right way to articulate it. Right. It's just like people who feel like there's something missing in their lives. And it's like those are the people that Bannon wants to get in to his uh, into his um, tent or whatever. The rootless young white men who play video games. Exactly. Incels. <laughs> is how, how he's put it in the past. And I've heard, yeah, I mean, if we, it doesn't, I don't want to say rank and file traditionalists because that implies a sort of, again, an organizational structure that doesn't exist. But I, one interview I conducted with an activist from, from Northern Europe, uh, a traditionalist as well, he noted, he said that, you know, you don't socialize. We don't socialize because we're all you know, we're all pretty messed up and a lot of us commit suicide and, and we're, some of us are so depressed, uh, you know, that the, the, the spark really, you know, for him, he was saying one great moment was September 11th, <laughs> all right, modernity is crashing. This is going, and then no, <laughs> it didn't stop it in his mind. Nothing, nothing ever. We're not, we're not on some downward trajectory. No, we're That's still pretty fucked up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're still heading in the same direction. Um, and yeah, it's fucked up, but think think if that's the sort of if that's the sort of event that it takes to make you feel hopeful <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's pretty messed up for sure think about think about what life is going to be like um it, it, there are other ways when I've, I've observed that too i've i've been trying to write an article on death in june for a long time Do you know death in june is no, I'm afraid not. I don't know. Okay, kind of pseudo adjacent to traditionalism, neo folk music. Hmm. Uh, apropos everything we were saying before about divesting from society, I think it is very important that Death and June does not sing with words in many hmm. cases. There's a lot of tra la 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 in this music because why say anything? What's the point? Hmm. Um, and and there are some people who who tie this to traditionalism, to Julius Evola, to writing the Tiger, but I always wanted to speak to more, and it is so hard for me to get people to speak to me. From this side, I can get neo-Nazi, white nationalist, white power, right-wing populist, anyway. But this sector, they don't speak to each other, and they don't speak to me hmm. that often. And and probably this last book is not going to help me much. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but but I think I think that has more to do it has to do with more than just just me, just an outside researcher with a Jewish last name. Hmm. Interesting. So it actually, um, you made me think of something too. Uh, I wonder, maybe it's worth mentioning the connection between traditionalism and, and accelerationism, which is something we talk about with our, like sometimes, because, but usually we'll talk about it in the context of left-wing accelerationism, right? Like, you know, you, you know, more tamer versions, you know, we hear Brianna uh, Greyjoy or Joy Gray, I forget, talking about, you know, we need to destroy the Democratic Party to start it up. And I wonder if you could speak to the, the form of accelerationism in traditionalism. Absolutely, because the, I th I think these incidentally overlap, and really they speak to a to probably a deeper drive among among dissidents. But yes, if if traditionalists on the right, as as many of them do, believe that we live in a time cycle, and that life is destined to be this bad and it needs to get worse before this dark age, the Kali Yuga, as Hinduism puts it reaches its climax, society implodes, and then we are reborn into a golden era and, and decline will, the cycle of decline begins again. If, if that's our fate, you really shouldn't, in the doctrinaire sense, want to go backwards because going backwards isn't possible. The only thing you can do is go forward. You need to embrace destruction. And this, this is, you know, part of the treachery, I think, inherent in, in right-wing traditionalism that, that has to be spoken about in plain terms. And, uh, you know, so what does that mean, though? We're still mm -hmm. speaking, you know, in, in, in quite quite vague terms. Does that mean that Steve Bannon should join the Green Party and <laughs> become a, you know, an LGBTQ activist? And, you know, or does it mean you, you get Trump and destroy the U.S. federal government? 
or try. <laughs> all, th- all those options are there. Now, there are some eccentric cases. There are alternatives to that. They're, they have to be described as that alternative uh, brands of traditionalism that say, no, actually, you, you do have a role to play. You can push things backwards. Uh, Julius Evola notably thought that he was seeing a reversal of the time, time cycle. So that's not an accelerationist doctrine. But, um, uh, but for most of them, destruction is how you move forward and and the destruction difference, breeds creation i guess uh? yes destruction breeds creation i mean the, the distinction here is that they're going out of their way to add a sort of spiritual religious eschatology behind mm-hmm. that what might otherwise be a sort of secular practical real politique impulse I yesterday had- maybe was i was just gonna say yeah i mean do you think yesterday too that that traditionalists are celebrating uh, or i guess it was the day before yesterday or i mean it, it seems like in the public opinion it's looking like a failure and a bit of the end of trumpism but we'll see it's a bit early Ab- absolutely absolutely i it's i've been this partially what i've been trying to do these past days to keep really close tabs on it steve bannon is basically useless to listen to at the moment on this mm-hmm. because I think he is still vying for and needs some sort of pardon from Trump or some intervention in his legal situation in the few days that, that are left. January um, so, 19th. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so I, ahead of that time, I don't think we're going to hear a lot of criticism of, of Trump or celebration of, of Trump's destruction coming from, from Steve Bannon, but others who, who I follow, um, I haven't spoken with anyone, you know, they loved, the rebellion, they loved the chaos of it um, for different reasons. One person said this is the closest that the United States has ever come to a working class uh, revolt or revolution, mm-hmm. and the left will never see that. Um, at, at the very least, I, there, there's not a lot of disappointment uh, over what, mm-hmm. what happened yesterday, uh, Wednesday, excuse me. Actually, that segues really nicely into uh, my two questions. So um, these are two interrelated ones, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. Like, one is that like the kind of worldview, to the extent that you can characterize it as a philosophy uh, that you see espoused by a lot of these people, is really unlike what you would expect to see from somebody who is brought up in Leo uh, in uh, liberal modernity, in the sense that it's extremely totalizing, right? Like vastly totalizing. Uh, you know, in some senses, I almost thought to myself when I was reading this, like Hegel would be put to shame by like how yeah. this tries to incorporate everything into it, right? Yes. Uh, and it was struck me that a lot of times, if you kind of try to give some intellectual coherence to this in the way that we academics might, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it does offer a kind of explanatory grid uh, that incorporates tons of stuff, not just in the material world, but as you put it, like the extra material world into it. Uh, And the second thing that I wanted to ask you related to that is, while I was reading this, I was thinking about some of our listeners and thinking and pondering that one of the kind of big picture doctrines that they might have gravitated towards for these kind of totalizing explanation uh, was classical or orthodox Marxism, which does have a kind of big picture view of society. Uh, And yet most of the people that you see here aren't really all that interested, it seems, in economic issues. Sometimes they are, like Steve Bannon, uh, you had that kind of wonderful narrative uh, where he was uh, in the South Midwest and somebody threw him a Coors and he doesn't drink now. But, you know, there's kind of a symbology to that, right? Uh, he yes. wasn't being given a crap beer. He was given, you know, a good, you know, beer that you can get. Good American beer. Than any, yes. yeah, yeah. Good American beer, yeah, you can get at any gas station. Um, but, you know, he talks a little bit about, yeah, we need to help the working class. We need to, you know, have a working class revolt. But they don't really just seem that interested in economic issues in the sense that they want to completely remake the capitalist order, at least not to the same extent you, you see with classical Marxists for whom political economy is absolutely central. It mm-hmm. almost always seems subordinated to the spiritual idea. Cultural. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, yeah. I was just wondering if you could mince this a little bit because. I mean, I mean, the distinction, what was interesting about Steve Bannon is that it, and where we see the distinction is there's, there's a sort of causality um, inversion, let's say, with most with most traditionalists. I mean, you're certainly right to say that traditionalist, traditionalism is generally disinterested in, in material inequalities because mm-hmm. it's disinterested in material period. Mm-hmm. It's disinterested in money, goods, bodies, uh, if, if we take it at face value. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the reason for that disinterest is, is a devotion to the spiritual or the, or the immaterial. Bannon had an odd little take on this where he says that really spiritual vitality is, is the most important thing we could possibly do. Collective spiritual vitality is, is what this is all about. Well, how do we get there? Well, suddenly he starts talking about economics again. Yeah. 
um, and 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 sovereignty and order. I mean, it was ec economics really being being though a register a register of, of social order. But nonetheless, the, the, if we just focus on on economics and spirituality for a moment, there's there's. I mean, spirituality is secondary to 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 materialism in that in that sense for him. Um, mm -hmm. It is the result, the byproduct of of a of a more enlightened, of a more virtuous material set of relations. We're mixing with a lot, a lot of things here, and I'm not a, I'm not a scholar of Marxism to the extent that I c I can comment on if you know to to what extent that appears in other strains of Marxism. Marx wasn't against spirituality per se, of course. Mm -hmm. He was against it as a uh, as as a as obscuring um, and excusing and preventing any any sort of change to a to an unjust uh, set of material relations. Uh, but the distinction I would see with Steve is just just the the emphasis on, on, on spirituality really being in the center, that that is, that is the, the absolute goal. Um, yes. I'll put it, yeah, I'll put it somewhat different way. Um, that's a little bit less like academic -y, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. I guess this is what I was really getting at. You know, you're 21, say 35 year old white dude, you know, in the basement mm -hmm. that Bannon wants to reach. He's playing mm -hmm. video games. Uh, he's got a job at Chuck E. Cheese, but he's still living with his mom because he can't pay his bills. Why would he embrace Donald Trump rather than somebody like Bernie Sanders? Or why would he embrace Bannonist traditionalism rather than AOC, mm -hmm. uh, you know, universal health care? All the kind of things that a good liberal socialist Rawlsian like me thinks we should have. And would help that person. <laughs> yeah. What to help them materially, you know? Yeah, yeah. What what do you what do you get from Trump that you don't get from from Bernie? Uh, you, national nationalism, national identity. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think if if we wanted to add to that, we would say embeddedness, meaning, mm -hmm. uh, spiritual meaning, mm -hmm. a connection to history, um, uh, feeling embedded in history that that you're in, you know. It, not simply lost at sea in this in this mm. uh, in this world of progress. Um, now Bannon doesn't like to use the word identity a lot. We've mm -hmm. we've had a number of conversations with him, but that's I don't know what else I would call it. Yeah, um, uh, an archaic identity, a pre an, an extra rational identity, or like thick culture or something. Sure. Yeah. Yes, we could come up with probably a number of ways to say that, but it makes absolutely. a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. So I was I was also curious, uh, maybe backing up a bit more to sort of questions of methodology. I'm I'm sort of interested in the ethnographic method, and maybe you, this could even go back to your earlier work. Um, just kind of curious of how, like, what that's like. Um, maybe if you're explaining to somebody who doesn't know what ethnography is, um, like like what that's about, and and I'd, be, I'd just be interested in um, what like how was that experience for you the first time you started hanging out with you know, an ethno-nationalist. I just kind of want to know what that was like for you and what you did to kind of maintain, um, you know, uh, loyalty or not loyalty, but I guess uh, consistency with ethnography and, and what you're trying to, what you were trying to accomplish. Uh, I had this imaginary scenario where, you know, you just went up to the bar and you're like, hey, let's grab a beer, you know? So how about, you know, uh, you know, the Jewish problem? Let's start there. And, you know, you know. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the Jewish problem? Yeah. Uh, it was it was hard and it it's changed a lot as as years have gone by i i really started again what the standard for ethnography that i as as i had understood it was i mean you you go out in the field and you form relationships with people that's that's ethnography's key resource it's like investigative journalism but but deeper and more dialogical um and all of the theory it was mostly framed in moralistic terms was that okay you're going to meet these people and by the way you're going to share authorship with them mm -hmm. and you're going to empower them um and you're going to adopt their definitions of themselves because the goal of ethnography is 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 to really learn to see and interpret the world through the eyes of the of the people who you're studying and and yes this is all good because because they're good people right and we like them <laughs> That's the unstated uh, subtext to this all, but anyways, that's that's how a lot of a lot of the theory went. Um, my first my first thought was that's dumb, <laughs> and I actually all of the all the observations about the limitations of objective knowledge and objectivity, notwithstanding, I think that objectivity is a, is a is a valuable ideal. So let's strive toward it. I'm gonna I'm gonna study these people 
It's going to be dispassionate. There's going to be no love letters. And, um, and, and, you know, I'm going to be this old fashioned ethnographer. So I went and I talked to them. It was, it was actually easy for me to talk about, say, the Jewish question, because I, I was kind of disciplined with myself in saying the purpose of you speaking to this person is not to settle the score on whether or not immigration is good. And by the way, I'm not interested in the question of whether Jews are good or the cost happen. These are not engaging questions for me. So why am I going to spend time on them? Stronger man than me. I got to say, <laughs> I wouldn't have been and able to do it. <laughs> to, to, well, and, and, and there are other, there are other places for it. I'm pretty opinionated otherwise so that might've helped me that to kind of compartmentalize. And it helped that it was Sweden and Scandinavia, not the United States. Uh, um, I would have had a really hard time back during the Obama administration doing this type of work with the tea party movement. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, you know, there's, there's a difference when it's your home society. But anyway, so I had that, I had the distance going, in other words. Right. Um, you know, an old fashioned ethnographer, uh, objective, or at least striving towards it, uh, accepting it as an ideal. Um, the thing is, <laughs> all of that, that precious, sweet, sappy sounding uh, theory I was just talking about, if we even want to call it that, that you need to be collaborating with the people you study, you need to work together to understand how they how they see the world, and you need to surrender some authority, you need to be in dialogue, you cannot monopolize uh, the conversation. It, I came to think, and, and I came to think eventually quite strongly, that the justifications for that are not only moral, they're also epistemological. That is to say mm. that they are also good because they teach us more. Mm. Um, it, it, they, they build empathy in the sense that empathy is distinct from sympathy, mm-hmm. and to the extent that empathy is knowledge not a stance, um, not an edict or an endorsement or lack thereof, but instead simply knowing more about what it's like to see the world through someone else's eyes. In order to do that, uh, you had to sustain fairly good relationships. And a product of sustaining good relationships and having a lot of contact, of course, is that you get to know people and you start to see them as being more than just one thing. You see them as Gosh, what's, here's an example. I mean, Steve Bannon. Uh, Steve Bannon has a daughter with liver disease. I mm-hmm. have a daughter with. I have a daughter with liver disease. Yeah. We have a lot of conversation, a lot of conversations off the record about that. The hell, do I do with that? <laughs> Some yeah. of those conversations were really uh, very, very important <laughs> to me. Um, it does that mean that does that absolve anything? Does that mean that I want to go out and, and, and make them a cover for his, his political ideology? Certainly not, but I'm not going to be able to speak about him in the ways that I would had I maintained distance. Um, and mm-hmm. it's real knowledge about the actual person who's there. So, um, so things get complicated. In other words, it's not just the political ideals. It's, it's that, it's that you have to grapple with more information. Um, and I've had, you may know, I mean, I've had a lot of discussions with people about the ethics of this, of this method, not just doing it, but how do you write about it? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, I go back and forth. There are things I've written and things I've thought that I, I, I no longer stand behind. But the, the underlying principle that I still embrace is that it is better to, to grapple with the information that is there. Um, if my conclusions about someone are going to be dependent upon my not knowing them, well enough or not knowing certain things about them. I'm not sure that I want those conclusions. And I'm going to be very suspicious of people who, who, who can only sustain their conclusions if they keep, keep distance. Um, so I feel like I've spun off a little bit here. No, no, but that's good. I mean, I love that answer. I love that answer so much. I mean, I, that's actually why I find your work so interesting because I think, you know, as both Matt and I are left-wing academics, um, you know, um, I think one of the things that's missing on the left often is any sort of effort to do exactly the kind of work that you're doing, which is to really understand, because I am a firm believer um, that if we want to, you know, bring people over to our side, we should do a better job of understanding what the other side actually thinks and, and what's going through their mind and what's the justification. And I personally think that that involves and that, and it, that necessitates a kind of humanization of the other side, which I think in some sense is the work that you're doing. Um, and I think there's such a temptation to want to dehumanize. So I just, uh, so I think it's a great answer. Absolutely. And, it, and it's, it's worth stating some of the basic facts of what you just said. You said understanding the other side. That does not mean relativizing. Mm, yeah. 
I mean, it, understanding, knowing what they said, knowing what happened to them at X point in their life, those, I'm, I'm afraid that sometimes that level of just plain detail, not only is it not known, but it's not, sometimes it's not known for a reason. It's not known because it will trouble the conclusions and the generalizations that we want to draw. If that's the case, the problem is with your generalizations. It cannot exactly. be with it cannot be with learning more about yeah. the thing you're wanting to talk about, and that's it's I, I, it's 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 crucial. I will say, when it, it's it's worth remembering though, if if you're an academic who is committed also to a political perspective, that when you form relationships with people, I think when you form relationships with with anybody we can call it collaboration as we do in, in, in anthropological and ethnographic theory. But in, in real life, what happens when you're friends with somebody is that there's often a bit of seeding of control there. You yourself will be changed based on the relationship. And let's hope that you're the most you can hope for is that you're honest and, and aware of that. But what, what comes out of that experience is, is chaos. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a lack of control. Um, you see control, and it's one reason why I'm I'm a little skeptical of ethnography for any political purpose whatsoever. Um, if we're going to practice it in the way that it has been valued by ethnographers themselves and also other disciplines, if, if we're going to practice it in the way that it produces some of its signature insights, you should never go into it thinking and and planning on a particular outcome. The experience will contort your voice. You will surrender some authority uh, of your texts. It's 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 again it's, it's chaos. Um, so this is a soapbox top soapbox no, topic for me. So, so interesting. Um, you know, actually, it, it brings to mind another question I had about you know, did you ever have any experiences of spending time with uh, certain ethno nationalists and you know developing a relationship with them? That then later on they they change their their views about some things and and I, I the reason I, I have this question is because have you heard of Daryl Davis? There was a documentary I think on Netflix yes. about him. He's this yeah okay so you know that story uh, yes right and I think that so that that uh, that story came to mind. I actually wrote an article kind of related to that about like the importance of humanizing and compassion in Aereo. Um So yeah, um, so has that happened? For wow. You? First, I really want to read your article, but it it has. I've been because of some theoretical debates I've had in academia, I've been reluctant to put them forward because I don't want that to be the justification. Oh, of course. Yeah, of course. I want us to have a, I want us to have an honest reckoning with our own capabilities as, as ethnographers, but yes, I've had, pe this will sound funny again. I've had people call me in the middle of the night and say, I know the Holocaust took place. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's... You know, I, I mean, uh, which was in this case, it was a big deal. That was, a, you know, I was, I was actually pretty shocked to hear that. Wow. Um, I've had, I've had people warm to Jewish politicians that they had not in the past. Um, I've, I've even had in, in one instance, I've had a politician call me up to discuss an issue and a topic um, because they knew that I had, this was someone that I'd, you know, I'd done field work with, but I'd also gotten to know fairly well. And they knew where I stood on the issue and wanted to hear my, hear my perspective. And it may have changed a little bit of something. Um, and wow. then there are the intangibles. There are people who have never, I think, had a lot of interaction with a Jewish person, a an academic, a left leaning academic, and and I knew for me it was shocking to be able to get along with them, and I, and I'm fairly certain for them it was shocking to be able to get along with me so well. And I know that they, you know, they, they've spoken about that fact to, to some of their friends. So I, you know, it's I, I would love to see like a big dramatic you know, be able to offer you some, some big dramatic conversion story, uh, like, like some of those that we, we look at, but uh, short of that, there's, there's, there's certainly a lot of instances. Yeah. Where, where things have changed. Yeah. Well, that actually leads me to my last question, uh, which is a bit more of a loaded question because uh, I'm concerned not with uh, just with describing things accurately, but sincerely with changing hearts and minds, as it were. Um, so appreciating the fact that that's not typically uh, the goal of an ethnographer, uh, and I absolutely agree that that, has, that just describing has its place and it's a vital activity. What would you say is the best way uh, of reaching these people? Let's just call it that. Uh, and getting them to at least give you the time of day. Uh, and I'll give you an example that I engage in as a theorist, right? I mean, I do a fairly typical thing, which is just 
I pick up a book by a conservative author, our seeds make the rounds, uh, and I offer a theoretical slash political criticism of it, right? This yeah. is what it does well, this is what it does badly, blah, 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 here's lots of detail, so you can tell that, you know, I've at least taken it seriously. Uh, overall, this is why I think it's pr- wrong. Sometimes I actually just, I will say, actually, I think they get some things right if it's a really good thinker like Roger Scruton or something, but yeah. usually it's yeah. just like, this is what's wrong with it, so. Yes. You know, that's the way I approach it. But do you have a, an alternative or do you think that there's a different, better way? I mean, are you speaking about the, the sort of face-to-face contact and interaction or are you speaking more on that abstract level of ideas? The abstract level of ideas, but I'll leave it to you. I'm just kind of curious about how you think we could tackle the problem of winning people over or at least getting them to hear us. First, taking, taking the ideas seriously is key. I love that you just said that in the way that, that you described it. I mean, bear in mm-hmm. mind, it would be an amazing feat for someone to write a book of pure and total nonsense. <laughs> That's as much of a challenge as it would be, I think, to write the opposite. Mm-hmm. Um, or for someone to develop a philosophy that is 100% ugly, evil, wrong, stupid. Um, so there's going to be something there that doesn't mean that we should just devote ourselves to finding what's good and ignore everything else and its potential consequences by any means. But mm-hmm. Um, but that's I, I would like to see more of that perspective. I think there's an imbalance, especially with people commenting on the right, on the radical right from the left. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so, so there, so there's that at, at the at, at the level of ideas, um, and it's enough. It's a surprise enough to I think to a lot of these figures also to to be taken seriously that that can that can start dialogue, and dialogue is good. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a sappy thing to say, but dialogue is good. Friendship is good. Isolation, I think, is bad. Right. Yeah, I totally um, agree. Um, but I also, you know, they've, one thing that I've seen in Sweden, a lot of anti-racist activism that I think is good, in, and I don't think it's all good, but some that I think is really good has invested in localism um, and and treated that as, as a sort of arena where you can actually see some some collective engagement that would bring people together that you know, who otherwise are not. Um, and I, you can extrapolate a lot out of that. And when you meet someone face to face, if you're engaged in some particular activity or concern or initiative, you do see our official identities sort of take a back seat. Um, and, and you can see new bridges formed and, and it doesn't mean that they will stop being who they were before, but you might find a new parallel uh, relationship or way to speak to somebody on some issue that didn't exist okay. before. Um, that's informal. It's unsystemic, uh, unsystematic. I would I'd rather say. Yeah, but but I th- I think it's quite powerful. We also realize that a lot of us are hypocrites in good and bad <laughs> ways. When you do that, if you if you know drill down, do not massify, do not totalize, uh, do not invest too much in our official identities, and 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 new things crop up. No, thank you. That was really helpful. Yeah, no, for sure. Actually, it's it's interesting. I think uh, one of the goals, sort of, of the of the podcast, even though we're definitely on the left, is you know to try to be um, to lit to listen and, and do justice to the other side. And actually, I think I've noticed it had a couple like some effect. I actually did have someone contact me, you know, on Twitter saying, you know, I'm I'm sympathetic to Richard Spencer. Like, you guys should have him on the show, but you guys are kind of changing my mind a little bit because you're talking reasonably. So, you know, I hope that we'll, we'll continue to 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 um, to have that goal go forward, I suppose. I can tell you, I think that is more important than a million Huffington Post position pieces. Yeah. I, I, I really do. It, it, and it, maybe that's not true. It just excites me more. <laughs> it excites me much more too. Like, I mean, that's why I find the Daryl Davis story so interesting, which I feel like I should have said for the listeners, because I just kind of mentioned it, you know, this, he was a black blues musician who, uh, who started spending time with KKK members and just talked to them as human beings and talked about music and his love for music. And he's collected, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of robes from former KKK members. So it's an incredible story. I mean, absolutely. And it, it reminds us, I mean, when, when you talk about humanizing someone uh, as, as you were earlier, Victor, I mean, I mean, that, that can sound vapid if it, if, if it weren't for the fact that there was so much dehumanizing going on. And if so many of our characterizations were not dependent upon dehumanizing and treating people like cartoon characters, if you, if, you know, if, if it's, it's like the old, the old adage, you, you know, the, Oh, I've, you know, I've heard of the guy. No, he's absolutely not gay. He loves sleeping with men, but no, no, <laughs> no, he's, <different. laughs> 
uh, there, there are a lot of people involved in these circles as well, as well who are there because of circumstance. And they say that they're on the radical right. They say they're not a, a neo-Nazi because, you know, because they believe in these ideas, but it actually has to do with a girlfriend from high school right. or something like that. You're almost giving it too much credit by, by treating the labels and the, and the, the exterior as, as, as stretching deeper than it may actually go. Um, and likewise, you know, on the flip side of that, there are liberals and explicit anti-racists who can be pretty damn racist yeah. uh, behind closed doors. Yeah. And I also, I mean, one thing I noticed too is, um, that the, it, it like, you know, sort of ang like anger and condemnation, it's like a quick fix. It's like a, or it's like, a. I often feel like people get a high from it, you know, and that's why it's like both sides. It feels great. The left and the right, that righteous indignation, like it's such a drug, it's a high. And I feel like you like, you know, this, this, this approach, which I know your goal is obviously not to change minds, but I think, you know, developing a relationship that's disruptive of that, I feel like that's disruptive of that kind of like, like, you know, uh, dialectic of desire and enjoyment that, that I think they get, a, they get from, from, from condemnation. I should say, I think it's also very difficult today because the way that a lot of politics is carried on in social media tends to reward people who engage in essentially dis aggressive displays uh, of I want to call it toxic masculinity, but I've also seen women do it, right? But it has this kind of macho quality to it, right? Where you try yes. to own someone or you try to essentially destroy them as the lingua franca now goes. Uh, and, you know, I would be lying if I said that I did take some satisfaction in that also. Sure. Um, <laughs> watch the average thing of, you know, Dave Rubin just, you know, getting owned by this person or whatever. But <laughs> I really, it's certainly not constructive to the kind of engaged dialogues that you're calling for. And, you know, it's not supposed to. I'm calling for it. I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm calling for it at least. <laughs> well, uh, the when you said mixing stuff up, when you said you know taking the dialectic and just just messing with it a little bit. Oh, it disrupts. Like I think it disrupts disrupting, the... disrupting. I love it. I absolutely love it. I mean, I know it's not my official goal to change minds, but yeah, I can't do. <laughs> not in any particular way. But I don't think this is good. I do not think this the hardened positions where we are all just dicking each other over, you know, totally. in the in the best way possible and to get you know as many likes and high fives as we possibly can yeah exactly. I, I i don't believe in that and i and as an educator i don't like it because we're i feel like we're getting you know it makes us stupid because mm. we we learn less um it's an exercising of a, a sort of power to keep boundaries up between ourselves from other people yeah. and uh it will make us more ignorant and it's boring <laughs> It's bad for society. So I, yeah, but it, but it feels good. I do know that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I, I know I'm cognizant of time. I don't know how much time you have, but I, uh, I did have a couple more. Can, oh, I can stick around a little bit. Yeah. That was okay. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Good. And since you had lots of other interviews too, I feel bad. <laughs> this has been by far the most interesting okay, good. For, for three days of interviews actually. So awesome. no, I'm glad. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. Uh, um, so actually, you know what you were just saying, uh, brought to mind, um, I kind of wonder what your experience as a professor, as an educator has been with students and who find out about your work. And I know that obviously student campus groups can be pretty polarized and angry. And I just wonder if, if you, if you've had any experiences that, that you could share with that, like positive and negative they've it's been exclusively positive oh, okay awesome awesome actually no i love i say i love all my students but i, I do Th there's no the people who i have trouble with i think it's telling <laughs> people i have trouble with are older academics mm. and then center left and center right journalists really mm. <laughs> yep i i do okay with the with most kind of you know, far right, I don't know what to call them really. Um, uh, commentators, because they recognize that I take them seriously, to your point earlier, Matthew. Um, and, and you can have in-depth discussions with them, and I, and I like that. And then, and then, you know, the activist progressive left um, has been good too. Um, I, I kind of want to take this in a different direction, if you don't mind. No, absolutely. You know, so we're kind of talking about my book. I think it's telling the... I've gotten some rough reviews from the center left and the center right. I've gotten some good ones from the right, kind of Trump world, but I've gotten almost exclusively positive reception among the Brazilian left. Really? Hmm. You mean like the, the Lula types? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. And, and that's actually where the book is doing best right now. It's just, just oh, came out of Portuguese. I've, it's, it's been easier to promote there than any place else. And I, 
I have a self self serving narrative about all that, <laughs> but I think there's there's something to be said about about someone who's very invested in the symbolics of activism. You know, do how often do I call Steve Bannon a fascist in the book? Mm. Um, you know, do I is my tone sufficiently demonizing uh, uh, yeah. throughout the text versus versus someone you know, like Gene Willis in Brazil, who's been under extreme threat, of course, an ally of Lula's, um, Glenn Greenwald, uh, you know, people who are facing actual tangible <laughs> threats from the people that we're talking about in, in that is invading their lives and threatening them in, in ways that, you know, a, a journalist in a flat in London is not being threatened by them. Um, you know, they've looked at the book and said, wow, it has taught me all these things about these people that I didn't know. Um, yeah. And... And, you know, perhaps, you know, forget what the tone is, the, the message of the book and its content is not flattering of these people. And that's what mm. matters. And I've learned something new and that's good versus, you know, this, this LARPing, <laughs> I think that happens from people who are not actually facing, um, you know, facing, facing a political threat in, in the way that these others do. So they're, to bring that back to the, to the students, I, I feel like, you know, some of the leftist organizations on campus, you know, I have good relations with, with some of their students. They, they like the substance of this. Uh, you know, I have a lot of them in my classes and, and they, I, f I feel like they're less of it for all the talk about cancel culture and, and PC yeah. mobs, the people more invested in particulars and who actually want to do something, uh, are it, it speaks to them i can and, speak to the same experience actually so my most popular class this or last semester i guess now uh was introduction to the political right uh and i was quite worried about it because cool. i made no bones about it that like look we're gonna be looking at fascist literature we're gonna be looking at nazi literature like it's important to understand the far right as well as like the more you know sugary centrists you know the roger yeah. scruton types and yep I was a little bit concerned because I'd never taught at an American university before and I'd heard so much about cancel culture and how you know, you're going to be shouted out. But actually the students I had were really interested in the stuff. Like we yep. really wanted to learn about it. Very passionate would come to me after class and they're like, you know, am I getting this right? You know, what's this whole thing about Mussolini saying this here? What does it mean? And all that stuff. And it really perplexed me because <laughs> I'd heard so many of the stereotypes about this. But I think it was in part because there was real dearth of literature on the subject or they'd never really been exposed to some of these ideas before so naturally they were interested in them and i mean i made no bones about it either i'm like look i'm a kind of liberal socialist i'm going to be criticizing this stuff because i think it's wrong but we're going to take it seriously and we're going to try to unpack what the appeal of it is uh i got a lot of papers at the end where people would say like look like there's a kind of core to some of this that might be appealing it's just distorted or it's misplaced uh -huh. or any different things so it was really interesting to me as a social experiment just to see that a lot of the stereotypes I had about left-wing students was deeply wrong, you know, at least that. my own experience at yes. you know, college, one college. Well, I think that, I think also a lot of students, see, I don't say that to them. I keep my students in the dark the whole time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. I do my best and I tell them this class will offend them. I tell them if, you, if you're looking for trigger warnings, write it over <laughs> the entire syllabus. Everything is a trigger warning. Yeah. I'm not going to bring you back to earth at the end of each lecture. What's the um, class? <laughs> you know, we, when uh, What's the class like? To, oh, the, radical the nationalism cult. and okay, global nice. neo-fascism. I suppose the title is kind of out. You know, I'm not quite oh, as, cool. as 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 I don't have as much ice in my ice in my stomach as as I would li like to, as Swedes say. It's not quite <laughs> as 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 dry. But um, but one thing that I think that they all like, you know, the the conservative Republican students like it, but the the left wing students do too. Is that I'm not I'm going to treat them like adults. I'm going to give them this literature and I'm going to trust them to, to interpret it. It's not the same thing as saying, believing in, you know, in balance, which is a concept that I hate. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, or in neutrality, it's saying that, you know, if we want to learn about this, we want to learn about it. Well, it's going to take our full attention. Oh yeah. And yeah. And if, and if you say that, you know what, I trust you to do that. And I trust that you're not going to walk out of this classroom and start, you know, start another Holocaust. Uh, it's, it's empowering to them. Um, so it's, those have been my most successful classes at CU. It, it got rate, it got rated a top in a kind of a student publication. It was really, really the top class on campus. Uh, a couple wow. Of that's years awesome. Ago. 
Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. So it's been a yeah. delight to do. Yeah. yeah it's, it's funny. Earlier you were mentioning those, some of those the reviews. I mean, I did take a look online and you must be thinking, I think it was in The Guardian and I remember reading it and I was just like, holy crap, this guy's an asshole. Like, I don't know. He he, ga- he gave you shit for calling Steve, St- Bannon Steve or something like that. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, it was ridiculous. I was like, does this guy care about, I don't know. It was, yeah. So I was outraged on your behalf. <laughs> Oh yeah, well, I, I appreciate. I really appreciate that, that <laughs> Victor. It's, the interesting thing I, I hear so often, um, again from that sector, the center left or center right, or older kind of establishment academics at the end of, of their careers, is, you know, they'll read my work. I know that it's something new for them. Say traditionalism, mm-hmm. you know, for, as it was for the the journalist in the Guardian, Luke Harding. Um, you know, so I know he learned new things from reading the book. And they get to the end of it and they're like, oh my gosh, this is so unbelievably dangerous. And then they turn around and turn to me and say, you didn't explain just how dangerous this is. And if someone is in that state of mind, you know, two things are either, one of two things is true. Uh, Either they think that other people are not capable of the same inferences that they are capable of, right? Um, Or or their interest is really in me. You know, it's Mm. not is the book going to explain to people and show people how dangerous these ideas are? Because obviously they are, unless, unless this person has powers of perception that us mere mortals don't have, you know, then it's just about me and then who cares? So it, it's, it's an observation that came in, came in that, in that review that was just like, to me, it's transparently stupid. Oh yeah. Totally. What are you totally. going to do? do? I'm kind of curious about some, I know you mentioned like positive reactions to the book. Just going to ask quickly, like what, what reaction Steve Bannon had to the book, if he was happy with it, that was. Well, he, I, I, he thought that his sections were, were faithful, at least to what he said and thought. Um, he hasn't told me that he's read the whole book, even though I'm sure he has, <laughs> because okay. he does that sort of thing. But, um, you know, so he, he gave me that. Alexander Dugan liked it. Olavo de Carvalho in Brazil did not like it. <laughs> at he seemed all. like a crank anyway, though. Oh, oh Jesus. no, he has, uh, you know, and he has a huge social media following. So he has, he has released videos that have gotten like hundreds of thousands of likes, you know, that are titled like Ben Teitelbaum, the liar. And oh, wow. It, it's, you know, really all over the place, but that's, that's a whole nother, that would take another yeah. podcast. To go he was through. the ice cream <laughs> fan, right? Yes. Nice memory. Yes. Exactly. Well, you know, that, it was very vividly described. Right? Let's just put it there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. And then I guess like just, just closing up, I was just kind of curious if there's anything, I know we covered a lot of stuff, but um, if there's anything that you feel like in other interviews, you know, you don't get a chance to talk about that you think is really important to take away from the book, if you want to add something like that. Oh, gosh. I mean, you, you both are pretty attuned to the kind of the intellectual history um, and the intellectual profiling of, of traditionalism. So that that's a really refreshing um, alternative here. I, you know, people who are more interested in the journalistic aspect of it, I, 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 I wish more people would latch on to the story of Jason Giorgiani and the mm-hmm. lover, um in the book, because even though it's not as much of a news item and we're not dealing with people who were successful, not that, you know, Bannon and Dugan, it's, I think it's up in the air whether or not they're successful. Uh, that, that storyline was pretty, pretty, uh, gosh what's that overwhelming for me to study and, and follow <laughs> my editor didn't really want to put it in but i was i was just just taken with it so i would encourage cool. any of, any of your, your listeners to pay attention to that that too okay awesome thanks so much for coming on this was a real pleasure yeah i had a great time and i really learned a lot from your book and uh both air of you will come out pretty soon in jack ben and uh, you know and i'll let you a few more readers but uh you know, it deserves yeah. it deserves a wide audience totally I really appreciate that you both and best best of wishes it's a pleasure to talk to you and, and best of wishes in your academic careers too thanks so much later take care bye bye